Welcome to Goldfish on Games and today we're talking about this game, Morph for the Amiga, which was part of the very popular puzzle platformer genre. And being an Amiga game, it had to have some form of intro and a reason for why the whole game was taking place. And in this instance, you play as Morris Rolf, a kid who was strangely nicknamed Morph by his friends, who ended up in a tragic teleporter accident, who turned him into a set of disembodied atoms, and using these newfound powers, he didn't go and help people or do anything great, he instead decided that he wanted to track down the magic cogs that made that teleporter machine work, so he could return to his regular body. I have the original 500 release which came on a couple of floppy disks. I also have the CD32 release, which was based on the Amiga 1200 version. Now this included updated graphics as well as 12 extra levels, which brought the total up to 36. On top of that, they even added full controller support, which made for a nice change. The game also had a very reasonable, if very purple, manual, which gave you all the info you needed to play, as well as a more detailed version of the story, which didn't quite match up to the in-game intro. Which, as you can hear, started very suddenly and very loudly. You can skip this, thankfully, by just hitting the spacebar but it's still a very nicely done intro and it's still fun to watch even after all these years. Unfortunately, that cannot be said about all the versions, as some got low resolution still images rather than this beautifully animated one. There isn't always music playing in the game, but when it does, it's this really energetic funky beat, which really seemed to be a trademark of the Flare games. And if another world didn't teach us this already, never do your experiments during a thunderstorm, nothing good ever comes out of it. It doesn't take long before you're at the map screen, and depending on the version you will either have 24 or 36 levels to complete. The original Amiga release had 24 levels, but when they worked on the AGA and the SNES release, they found the time to add 12 more levels, and as the CD32 is based on the AGA release, it got all those extra levels as well. You are free to select any of the four worlds, and if you get stuck on a level, you can actually return here to pick a different world, but you have to complete the levels in order in each of the worlds. So this feature is great until you get stuck on all four worlds, at which point you're going to have to really knuckle down and complete one of them before you can continue. You wouldn't be shocked to find out that each of the four worlds are themed, and you might be able to even guess at the themes. So we have the laboratory, the factory, the garden, and the sewers. There really is just one goal for the levels, which is to find the cog that's been hidden and make it to the exit. You do that by using your powers of transformation to get around the obstacles of the level. Now the number of times you can transform between your various states is limited. You start off each level with an amount, but you will find more as you travel through the level. But transformations also cost tokens. Now these are the stars you can see on the HUD and you'll find in the levels as well. Now technically you can actually transform at will between any of the states which is useful for exploring, but unless you have the tokens, you'll fail the level and you'll have to do it again, but with your newfound knowledge. This is a puzzle platformer in the end. Morph can transform into four different states, which you might think would be based on the four elements, but they actually more closely align with the states of matter with the change of temperature. So we start off with the gaseous state, which allows us to float around, but can also be pulled into extractor fans and is also quite flammable. Andy cannot move down, you can only travel up, so if you need to go down, you're going to have to transform to another state. As we get colder, we transform into water, which can go through grates and put out fires, but will vanish into other liquids and can be sucked away into plug holes. Ramps also end up being a bit of an obstacle as you cannot go up them, only down. As we proceed to get colder, we turn into a rubber state, which can bounce around to reach new heights, can travel across water but can also be popped by spikes and fire. And as we reach the coldest state of all, we're finally fully solid. And in that state, we can bash through broken walls. It's immune to sharp objects, but will sink in water and can fall through weak floors. So as you can imagine, the trick is to know when to change state 
so you can get the cog and get out, but unsurprisingly, it's rarely a straight run. You'll have to go out of your way to find additional transformation tokens and pickups, which will allow you to be the states you need to actually complete the level. But as you're exploring the level, you'll also come across a map or various treasure chests. The map is great for allowing you to plan your attack and the treasure chests are just there for points. You'll also gain bonus points for having additional transformation tokens that you didn't use. Now you don't always have to use your transformation tokens to transform. Some levels will have heaters and coolers that will force a free transformation on you when you pass through them, which really starts to play on the states of matter that we described earlier, as we can start off in the very coldest solid state and work our way up to the gaseous state by going through various heaters. These cleverly end up being both an obstacle that you have to avoid or work around, or as an important part of your plan. Thankfully, there are no lives, so you can try a level as many times as you like, as long as you can put up with the professor's little digs at you when you fail. I swear he gets some sort of weird joy out of pointing out our failures, as he seems to have something unique to say for every situation. Each of the worlds had their own set of hazards that you'll have to avoid or try and work around though some of them actually end up being quite useful, such as the factory level which have magnets. These attract the solid state, which can leave you stuck or, if you have enough momentum, can actually help you travel to another part of the level. The garden levels tend to be quite open, so the gas state will travel up and then get stuck at the top of the screen. It also has a lot of spiky plants which can easily pop that rubber ball if you're not careful and the sewers are unsurprisingly full of water, which will quickly end both the liquid and solid state. And the laboratory tends to have flames, as well as most of the other types of hazards. There is a whole range of these different type of items that you'll find in the level, and some of them will actually be advantageous to try and get through, such as fans that can launch you into the air. The game's difficulty curve is actually quite reasonable, and the ability to jump between the four worlds means that you're rarely stuck for all that long but they really did try to ramp up the difficulty with those 12 extra levels they added, because some people did complain that the original game was a bit too easy. So you will have to get used to the idea of having to change states very quickly, such as midway through a jump with a rubber ball, or while falling while in another state. The original game was written by Peter Johnson for the Amiga and Atari ST, and an agreement was quickly reached with Flare Software to publish the game and to handle a PC port. Flair then went to Millennium as they had access to the consoles and a SNES and Mega Drive version were put into development. But after all that work, just four versions of the game actually came out. The three flavours for the Amiga and a Super Nintendo release. Now according to all reports that I've read, the other versions were complete, so I have absolutely no idea why they failed to make it to market. Though I'd love to be proved wrong and find out that they did get released just in a slightly obscure place, because I'd love to see how they compare. As we can see here what the three major versions of the game look like. We've got the classic Amiga, the AGA version and the SNES. And for the most part the graphics look pretty similar across the board. The AGA release added a few more colours and if you look real closely you can actually spot them. The SNES version took that as its base and then added an extra background layer which looks fine but doesn't really add anything to the game but I guess we should be thankful that it also doesn't get in the way like some other games that did similar things. The audio is mostly the same across all the versions, though I feel the SNES one doesn't quite have the same punch as the Amiga, but that could just be my bias coming through. But as the levels have mostly just ambient sounds, with the music saved for the intros and the menus, you don't get many chances to actually compare them. Via an interview with Kotapper, the original design documents for the game got published, and it's interesting to see how the game changed and actually remained the same from the original concept. There were a few different ideas of what the game story was going to be like. Two of them involved being a wizard's apprentice, and the other one involved the professor that we now know and love. The idea of having a set number of transformations to each state was also not fleshed out at this point. Instead you had a set amount of energy, which you could use to freely transform up or down through the states. It's also interesting to see that at one point they considered adding baddies to the game, which is something that never actually turned up in the final release. If you're actually interested in seeing this document, I'll include a link in the description. Now hopefully I've inspired you to give this game a go, because it's a bit of a hidden gem, at least in my opinion. But you're going to have to track down a second hand copy, because the game has never been republished. Though we are lucky that the rights holders, Flair, are still around, at least in their new name, Microvalue. Though they don't seem as if they've done a hell of a lot recently. 
so it might still be a stretch for us to see some republished Amiga games, but I really do hope that happens at some point. And until next time, I've been the Goldfish, that was a cog-powered teleportation machine of all things, and this was Goldfish on Games. <laughs>As I start my own quest to find the cogs for this teleportation machine, I'd like to thank you for watching this video, and if you enjoyed it, you should find various buttons on screen to let me know. You should know the drill by now.